The business models have been changing significantly, especially in the last few months. So that's where I'll focus my talk on. Um, when we look at users, that's where I love when Chris starts talking about is it, it's about the users. Let's start there. Uh, when we look at what our users want to do, uh, this is a general categorization of what they do. Mapping, monitoring, and then persistent surveillance. Uh, different versions of the same language will be used for different verticals, but that's a high-level classification of what our customers are trying to do with satellite imagery. So when you talk about mapping, I use the term 21st century mapping. The concept of static maps, if you lived in the United States 10 years ago, the AAA maps, they don't exist anymore. We actually use Google Maps. So the concept of a map, I still use the word, but it's a whole different way of representing the data. The cartography in 21st century has changed uh, entirely different than what uh, piece of parchment Columbus was carrying when he was going from Europe to uh, Americas. So the, the mapping scales are obsolete. Now we are talking about zoom levels. We're talking about the details in the imagery. So it's a whole different way of describing what mapping is. Um, and then obviously, as you have seen examples, it's no longer about 2D maps. It's 3D and then 4D and so forth. And then finally about mapping, there are companies which Sanjay talked about. They're talking about business intelligence, location information. That's what maps are of today, is they're no longer the static maps. They're the new dynamic maps of the 21st century. Second one is monitoring. Depending on what you're trying to do, there are certain applications. Uh, for example, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Probably they're looking at yearly monitoring of the entire continent. Whereas you have cities that are changing on a regular basis, so the frequency of how you want to update these data sets might be different based on the specific application people are looking at. So the scales are all the way from local to global scale. And then persistent surveillance. Surprisingly, there are applications popping up where people need now persistence. These used to be very niche systems provided by the defense agencies of the globe, but now they're being translated into civilian applications. So this is what we are seeing from our, our users as the needs they're looking for from the satellite imagery. So what are the business models as of, I would say, even a year ago? There are two distinct business models. The first one is based on capacity and privacy. So when you talk to defense agencies, military agencies, this is number one on their list. They want control. They want to have access on the satellites. They want privacy or uh, security on what areas they're imaging. That business model is not going to change anytime soon. There are a few tweaks to the business model, but what we are basically offer is access to the satellite in a window. When the satellite is going over a given dish, there is a window they can actually task the satellites, download the data, and do whatever they need to do. A lot of the times, we don't even see the data. So that, that kind of business model will persist. Because of the nature of the business, they pay a high price for their premium. The other thing is, uh, the way we look at the industry, if you the trends, uh, as we showed you in the plenary, is that the spectral resolution, the spatial resolution are getting better. So the way we see that is there will be three buckets of uh, uh, satellite companies going forward. When you have high resolution mapping, you have uh, high resolution mapping and monitoring, and then medium resolution mapping and monitoring systems. So that's how we see all the players in the industry settling down. So when you talk about that, quality becomes very relevant. When you talk about small sats, the one thing people need to understand is what is the quality of the data, because there is a fit for purpose discussion that we need to bring into place, uh, because these are all complementary technologies. And this is where the second box is where a lot of people don't understand how the models are changing. If you are a regular user, let's say you're in a university or a project-based user, the traditional model we call that per square kilometer model. So the first thing, uh, we get a call from a user and say, I need imagery over my site. And the conversation happens around, how many square kilometers do you need? Uh, and there is a minimum unit of square kilometers, 25 square kilometers from the archive, or 49 square kilometers for tasking. So these are actually antiquated business models. We don't use them anymore. Sometimes people still have the perception that these are the business models of the industry. Second one is accessing from the archive. This is where the satellite industries have made a lot of progress. In 2001, we launched QuickBird. 
QuickBird by itself would collect quarter million square kilometers a day. Today we have a constellation of four satellites. We have one more going up later this year. We collect close to four million square kilometers a day. That's almost half of the United States in one single day. So the collection capacity has basically increased by factors in the last few, I would say five to 10 years, compared to what we had when these business models were invented in the late 90s or early 2000s. The second business model is we never sell data. We actually lease the data, which we call perpetual license. And a lot of the times, if you look at project-based uh, uh, customers, they don't need perpetual license. They might be using the data for a few weeks, few months, few years at best. So we are now talking about licensing models that, not, that are not perpetual, but based on usage. And then obviously volume-based pricing. The more you buy, like I said, we collect 4 million square kilometers today. We have close to 7 billion square kilometers in our archive. So the more you buy, the better, better pricing you get. <laughs> and then um, spectral spatial based pricing. I'm a PhD in remote sensing. That's one thing uh, Sanjay was talking about. F most of the students are walking away from that kind of a language. They don't want to talk about how many sphere bands you have, how many multispectral bands you have. They want to develop an app so that they can actually solve a problem. So this whole conversation around spectral spatial based pricing is for the niche user set, mostly universities and few PhDs. But these models are very, very antiquated models. Finally, derived data from imagery. It's one of those fuzzy, fuzzy licensing a lot of people don't understand. When I give you imagery and you derive road data, you derive land use, land cover, you derive bathymetry, what is the licensing on the derived products? It's very fuzzy. And that's because we were a niche industry in the early 2000s. Now it has proliferated. We have evolved in the last 10, 15 years. So we are also evolving with that business. So what has changed in the industry? Like I said, from a satellite technology perspective, better spatial resolution. Uh, we, have, we started with sub one meter with Iconos, 60 centimeters with QuickBird, 50 centimeters with Worldview One. 30 centimeters with Worldview 3. So that trend will continue, but there is a point where economies of scale, if you start putting a satellite up there, loss of physics come into place. Based on the lens and the aperture of the satellite, the footprint will, will be minimized if you start increasing the resolution. So is it worthwhile to capture five centimeters from space? Probably not. So there will be economics that will come into place on top of the policies and laws Sanjay talked about. Next one is increased coverage. Like I mentioned, we're collecting 4 million square kilometers a day, uh, which translates to 1.2 billion square kilometers a year, eight times the land mass. So we are collecting a lot of data. And then recently, we announced a partnership uh, with Saudis on small sats. So around the mid latitudes where most of the population lives, by 2020, we'll come back 40 times a day. So that's the persistent surveillance comment I made is there will be technologies for every 20 minutes or so. Now you have the satellites coming and taking pictures. And then finally, competition from that perspective. Uh, uh, in the last four years or five years, the competition has picked up. So we are evolving with the competition. So how do we provide more value to the customer? Solutions is one way. Integrating into the workflows, that's where our head is as an industry. Infrastructure. Speed of access, uh, I joined Digital Globe in 2004. I would order imagery in our own building. A week later, it would show up on my computer. Today, I order the data. Actually, I don't need to because most of the data is online the moment it is collected. So uh, when we task the satellites, five years ago, it would take us anywhere between 90 minutes by the time the data is collected and it showed up in Colorado. Now it's less than nine minutes. And we expect that to get better over time. So you're talking about real-time access to the data. And then compute at scale. This is where we have made a lot of strides. If you look at the companies that could make maps at scale, I would say Google was the first one. In 2005, they made a very high detail, I use the word mosaic very loosely, but they did make a mosaic of the globe. But that was done manually. Today, we have technologies 
where we recently uh, finished the entire Mexico, which is around 1.8 million square kilometers in two days, with 100% QAQC, half a meter mosaic. So the technologies have come where we are creating these finished products at much faster pace by leveraging the cloud computing, the GPUs. Uh, Mark Freeborn was talking in uh, the plenary. All those technologies are helping us so we can actually not only collect raw data, but also start creating products. And then in terms of customer needs, increasing scale. Uh, in 2005, we had one customer, actually no, two customers who needed data at global scale. Now we have over 20 to 50 customers who want this data at global scale. That's because of the adoption of the technology. And then uh, expanding user base in markets. Believe it or not, some of the examples uh, Sanjay was talking about, we have a company that's basically taking our data, counting the cars in the parking lot, and predicting financial future of Walmart sales. We have never imagined that kind of uh, uh, customer, but using that partner ecosystem, now there are more markets being opened up. Uh, for example, Exad is another uh, classic example where they're using imagery-based information about McDonald's and so on, so they can actually advertise uh, what are the specials of that McDonald's when you're passing by, assuming you're a, you're a McDonald's user. And then that's where I believe business intelligence. Various companies, including UPS, FedEx, if they want to go from point A to point B, Satellite-derived data can give you that road information, the slope information from 3D, so that you can actually figure out your logistics. And then finally, the industry trends so Sanjay already talked about. There are various companies talking about platform. If you were at GeoInt a couple of weeks ago, there were like 20 platform companies. Everybody now starts having a platform on Amazon or Google or Azure. And then uh, the, the, the key point is maker movement. This is where what I mentioned is that the kids, the new talent, don't want to focus on traditional photogrammetry, GIS, remote sensing. They want to create apps and solve problems. So how are we reacting to that in terms of the business models? As I mentioned before, the first model where there are governments who want privacy, they want specific capacity, they want to control the access, that business model will stay for a long time to come. The only thing we are changing there is reduced infrastructure investments. Today, we give you a big dish. Now we are figuring out everything is becoming smaller and cheaper. So we're working on how do you make the infrastructure a lot more affordable, not only the big defense countries, but also for those who can afford uh, much lesser investment than the United States, for example. But most of the business model uh, improvements are on the, on the consumer side. It starts with tasking. In a way, we are actually discouraging tasking because we want to collect the data based on your inputs. We want to have those decks already prepared. When we have these 4 million square kilometers, the business model is very comparable to airline model. The moment airplane takes off, either you sell the seats or you lose the seats. So the same thing with satellites. It's going to come and go. Either you use it or you don't use it. So we are being very proactive, working with customers, partners, so that we can understand what are their tasking requirements, what are the weather windows across the globe, so that we can actually maximize. So we have metrics developed on what we call constellation uh, a scheduling system. We can tell you how efficient our satellites are, where is demand. For example, in South China Seas, I can build another 10 satellites and still don't have capacity, because a lot of people are interested on, on that particular area. So we, ha we have this whole model built on how do you optimize your constellation uh, when, when, uh, so that you're getting the maximum revenue from the in your investment. Next thing, as I already mentioned, all the data we collect is now on the cloud. So that has been the first big problem with our industry is that not by design, we had 90 petabytes of data. It was in Wyoming. And we couldn't add another couple of petabytes because the room was heating up. And think about it, a satellite imaging company more worried about IT infrastructure than running our satellites. So that's what cloud has done to us is forget about IT infrastructure. Now that's actually the cloud companies like the Googles and the Amazons are taking care of the problem while we can focus on how do you actually manage the content. And then the licensing models. Like, as I said, we only had one model called Perpetual. As I said, most of the customers don't need that. 
So now we have licensing models based on the usage time. Is it few months to few years? So that actually provides you a, a better pricing model depending on the length of usage. So now we have the computing capabilities. One of the things we have been doing is, can I create a half a meter mosaic of cloud-free data of the entire globe? Uh, last year, we did a mosaic of Africa. Uh, if you look at the cloud statistics, only 1.5% of African continent had clouds at half a meter resolution. Now we are working on making it cloud-free at half a meter. So these kind of fine detailed data is now available from the satellite companies. And then uh, uh, the other one is age, uh, age pr uh, pricing based on age. If you look at the utility of the data, especially for customers who value currency, after 72 hours, the value of remote sensing imagery starts going down. That's for monitoring purposes. For mapping, depending on where you are, developing na nations, some nations, the maps were made 40, 50, 60 years ago. So our archive that dates back to five, 10 years is still very relevant. So it all depends on what is the relevance and the value proposition to the customer, but that lever of age of the data is something we can provide to you depending on where you are. And then uh, usage models. Once I collected half a meter or 30 centimeters, I can resample the data to one meter, two meters, 10 meters, 20 meters, depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to identify a forest, you don't need 30 centimeter data. You probably need five meter data. So as we collect four million square kilometers a, uh, a day, we can actually offer the same data at multiple resolutions. And then revenue sharing models, we do realize that uh, this is what Sanjay was talking about is people are not, don't want to pay up front. They want to actually pay you based on productivity. So we are now looking at various business models. We have a program called Information Partner Program. 20 different partners work with us with a revenue sharing model. And they create the applications, and then we try to monetize together uh, imagery and other data they put together. So they are serving the customers in ways we, Digital Globe, cannot do it directly. And this is an uh, area which is very interesting is open source. Open source doesn't mean it's free. There is a misconception in the community open source is free. Open source is about data licensing. Uh, one of the things we have now developed is uh, during disasters, Nepal, Fiji, we provide data which is actually open licensing. What it means is that anybody can use the data without, basically they have the right to use the data for any applications, as well as it's also free. We also mentioned that for this particular instance, we are making the data available as free as well. So these are the kind of business models you will see us looking at. So if you look at it in summary, the imagery market is evolving tremendously. There are more satellites coming, different types of temporal resolution, different types of spatial resolution. So there's a lot more data. But the key thing is now everything is online. That opens up a lot more business models that were not possible before. And then we're also looking at the revenue sharing models. And finally, what do you do with the data? Is it an open data? What do you do with derived data? So a lot of things are changing. So if you have any questions, things are different than what they were even six months ago. So we'll be open for conversation. Thank you.